So welcome everybody. Thanks so much Maria for having me join in this conversation for your seminar. Today I'm going to share with you just an overview of the methodologies that are existing and then maybe just look at some of them, some advantages and disadvantages. And I've also asked at the end for Kyle um, Jackson and for Riska Dolly to share with us just a few minutes of the experiences um, with using online research because they also have projects going on that you might be interested in hearing about. And um, throughout the presentation, we will also have space for discussion. So if you want to pop comments into the chat, uh, please feel free to do so. I will check them um, as we are going. Um, I will have some polls throughout the, the presentations. Also, as an experiential learning exercise for those of you that are interested in doing online focus groups or interviews. Um, you are welcome to use some of these tools and tips and softwares that we're going to be sharing today. So 2020 basically started off with lots of plans, lots of goals, lots of actions that you wanted to take and to make this year achievable. Um, if you're anything like me, I usually have a list of things, um, not necessarily New Year's resolutions, but goals that I would like to achieve for the year. And um, I normally have a plan as to how I'm going to achieve those goals. And just when I thought I had everything ready to go, in walks COVID. And as you know, it has changed all of our lives. It has turned things upside down. It has thrown all the plans that we had to the side. And we were left, start trying to replan and rethink um, what it is we wanted to do. Um, with 2020. Some, some of our research, I know in my case, my research was put on hold. Um, plans had to be readjusted because I was working with a, a group of HIV infected young women in a big participatory project with, which wasn't possible anymore during the lockdown. Um, so it was really a, and it is still a very different time, especially in our city in Cape Town. I don't know if you've ever seen the roads this empty. Um, there were amazing shots that were put online of Cape Town during lockdown level five with just empty roads. The only people enjoying the streets were the penguins in Fishhook. And they were just walking wherever they felt and while we were prisoners in our own house. Um, so I did have a little bit of penguin envy back in lockdown level five. Um, but you know, in the academic space, things also started to change. Um, and we started to think about moving our teaching online, our research online. There was lots of talks about what we're going to do with the academic year for, for high school students, primary school students, lecturers like frenzying around trying to figure out how to move classes onto the online space. Um, you know, it was unprecedented. It, we always knew that eventually we would end up with online learning, but we thought we had lots of time. Instead, we had something like two weeks, three weeks to move our semester one modules online to create uh, a platform that students could engage in, that was data light, easy to use, accessible. Universities had to come up with plans to get technologies and data to students. It was a huge, huge learning curve for all of us students, learners, management of universities. And once we, we kind of figured out that, and we are still trying to figure out the best way to do this emergency remote teaching, we also had to consider our research, which is the other part of our academic um, lives and career paths and, and studies. And we had to think about, you know, the types of research that we are doing but also be cognizant of our funders, our deadlines. Um, so this is actually uh, the, my Facebook recent ad activity. So on Facebook, when you go to your profile and to your settings and you look at your recent ad activity, it will tell you everything that you've clicked on. And then you have a chance to leave feedback to say I'm satisfied or I'm dissatisfied or I feel neutral about it. Um, Google also tells me what age I am, so not my birth age, but my age in terms of what I'm clicking on. <laughs> it also tells me um, 
what type of hobbies I like and not because I told Google because Google sees like what videos I watch and my monitors my Instagram and my Facebook so all of these things, there's lots of research being conducted as we speak um, about us. And we also have a chance to participate in, in the research that is available to us online. So I'd like to draw your attention to these two sites. There's this Facebook dot, um, research dot Facebook dot com site. And if you visit the site, you will see that they've got a website tailored to academic researchers where you can apply for existing data. You can look at existing studies. They've got calls for research fellowships. They've got, um, I think they've got research funding proposals that you can apply for. I mean, all of that is available on the site. And the same for Google. Um, you can apply to Google for access to the big data that they hold and for access to, you know, future funding proposals and research fellowships. So you can apply as a, a graduate to go work at Facebook for an internship to see how um, this type of research works. So please do visit those websites. They are really interesting to read and or also to see their publications. Somebody is drawing on the screen and that is really wonderful. Please continue doing that. <laughs> so I'd like to swiftly move to our online methodologies. Now, these are not all. These are the broad names of the methodologies. Um, so I've separated them into the online quantitative methodologies and the online qualitative methodologies. The first one um, is the online clinical trials, then web-based experiments and online questionnaires. So we will look at those a bit more in detail in some of the examples. Then we will look at cyber ethnography, online content analysis, and online interviews and focus groups. So this is an example of the online clinical trial. Um, so the way these are conducted is that they've got really strict procedures about letting people into the trial. As you know, with RCTs, we have pre-specified recruitment strategies, um, sampling strategies. We have experimental groups and control groups. Um, everything is in a controlled environment and we can isolate the independent variables and measure the outcomes. And if you think about moving that, a very controlled environment and space into the online space, it can be a bit daunting. Um, but there is a journal, it's called the Journal of Medical Internet Research, where they publish this type of work. And um, there are so many papers around how you recruit people, how you sample people, the limitations of conducting online clinical trials, um, and the accessibility of participants to the platforms to participate in these trials. However, there are advantages to this method for um, the clinical trials. You're able to access a much larger uh, sample. You can reach far out uh, geographically, but it does limit it to people who have access to the computer and to the internet. So the findings of that clinical trial, and this trial was looking at the challenges that people experience with enrollment into the trial. And if you look at the results, they found that 80% completed the enrollment screening. So this is of the 880 that visited the studies website. And of that 80%, 38% had help tickets logged, meaning they were struggling to, to register and enroll for this RCT. The most common help ticket team issued was related to the study process. So they wanted more information around um, what the study was about. And this is very normal, because if you think about it, you can give your consent form to a participant, but 100% of the time, you have to clarify some questions and people will have a question for you. It's very rarely people will just sign and say, okay. That means that they don't really read the consent form. So 
If you think about the internet version of that and clinical trials are so controlled, the, the sampling criteria is strict, the stringent and uh, uh, the accessibility and gaining access to be a participant can be very daunting. So this was the number one ticket followed by obtaining medical clearance. So people wanted to know where should they go? Um, is there a study doctor or do they go to their own doctor? What is the cost involved um, to get medical clearance to participate in the trial? And then followed by other issues related to uploading their data. So this puts all the responsibility on the participant. There are some clinical trials which run the first phase of the clinical trial online, and then you can go to a registered center where you can upload or get measured for other outcomes. It all depends how the methods are mixed in the clinical trial. Web-based experiments are a bit different. I don't know how many of you remember the Facebook experiment where they manipulated the news feeds of people and then checked how that affected the negative and positive posts of the Facebook users on their own timelines. I don't know if any of you were part of that study. Nobody knew that they were enrolled to the study and nobody, afterwards nobody was made aware that their data was used. But it was a huge scandal. Um, and I think Facebook faced hefty fines for conducting the study. It was one of the first big web-based experiments. I think it was maybe seven or eight years ago now. It was a while back. And um, that is a great example of web-based experiments where you manipulate in what people see online and that changes an outcome that you can also observe online. Um, and then I'd quickly like to move to the online questionnaires. So some of you may have used these questionnaires before. What this is, is the 2020 version of the best free survey tools that you can use to create online surveys. And Kyle is going to share with us his example of his study that he used. Some of the critical things that you have to think about when you are looking for a survey um, a survey generator is to check how many questions can you input into this form what are the types of questions that it allows you to ask how many surveys can you load because you might want to load multiple um, questionnaires onto the link for different studies some only allow you to load one at a time and then you have to pay for the upgraded version Survey Monkey, for example, you have an unlimited amount of um, surveys you can load. The same with Google Forms. You have to check the number of respondents um, that the survey is able to give you, because some cap it at 200 respondents, some at 500, some is unlimited. You have to check the requirements for storage of the data, because some of them might only hold the responses in the form for a certain amount of time and then it automatically deletes it. You have to also check what data analytics you can get back from the survey. So Google Forms and SurveyMonkey will give you um, descriptive statistics, so bar charts, pie charts, based on the answers that you have received. And then you also have to check downloadability. So can you download the data in an Excel sheet can you download it as a PDF? And if you're downloading your data as a PDF, that means you can't do any other analytics on your data. So ideally, you want to download your data either as a CSV file or an Excel file. So it's really key to check um, those things when you are thinking about which, which platform to use. Okay, so I'd like to move to the qualitative research methods, because I think that's where like most of the confusion and curiosity is about now is, you know, how do we move our individual interviews and our focus groups into the online space? So as in the research world, there are different methodologies that we can use to collect data. Um, we can collect it quantitatively, qualitatively. We can collect it from primary sources of data, meaning from the person themselves. 
from secondary sources, so from existing literature, or even from third sources, which are reviews of systematic reviews. Um, and when we think about that in terms of the cyber research methods, we are also able to collect primary data and secondary data. So primary data would be when we interview someone directly over Zoom, such as a call like this, Facebook, WhatsApp, whenever we are talking directly to the person, we are collecting primary data. When we are looking at existing data online, so this is Facebook feeds, Twitter feeds, Instagram posts, um, blog posts, websites, then we are collecting secondary data. So keeping that in mind, when we look at this method of qualitative research, which is cyber ethnography, we are looking at communities online. So now you are thinking about a Facebook group that's existing. So for example, we've got the Brackenfell community group. So this is our community group online, where we post information related to our community, advertisements, events that are happening, concerns that may be occurring, crime, or even celebrations, anniversaries, or comments around politics and, um, and relevant issues at the moment. That's our online community. So I can do an ethnographic study of my community online, but it's very important when I do this type of study that I say in my title that it's a digital ethnography or cyber ethnography of the online space. Because you don't want to mislead the reader in thinking you're actually doing an ethnographic study in the community physically yourself with community members. Okay, so the online content analysis is very interesting. Um, if you look at these, these um, screenshots that I've put on here, you can see Instagram opened up their data, Twitter has opened up their data, Facebook has opened up their data for academic researchers and for social researchers to analyze the data related to COVID-19. So you can go to, if you just search the headings that I've put here and the authors of the papers, you can apply through these posts, through these websites to access the data. Um, a really interesting study that I, I did when I was putting this work together was the one on cross-country comparisons of public awareness and rumors and behavioral responses to the COVID-19 epidemic, an infodemiology study. I had never seen that word before. It's really cool. I want to do a study like that. But basically, if they've taken the word infographics, where you create a paper based on the results of your study, that's really engaging and easy to read, and they have used uh, principles of epidemiology, and they've scanned um, what is available online to map behavioral responses to COVID. Um, so really interesting what you are able to do. Remember, the data you put out into the social media domain is public. Even if you post it onto Facebook, if you take the time to read the fine print when you sign up with your Facebook account, you will see there are lots of instances where they say that they are going to use your data because you agree to the terms and conditions of the platform when you join the platform. So even though your profile may be private and only for your group of friends, that simply means other people can't see it. But it doesn't mean that Facebook owned company, the entity does not have access to your data. Twitter, for example, is a public domain space. What you say there already belongs in the public domain. You have given permission for other people to see what you have said and to attach what you have said to that profile. So if you've used your real name and surname and your picture, you have given permission um, for them to use your data that is on these platforms. So they are then allowed to open up the data for researchers because you've already signed off by signing up. 
TikTok, for example, is also the same principle as Instagram. What you upload belongs on your profile and although it's private for you and your selected friends, it still belongs to the company because you are using, you are renting space on their platform um, by signing up with the account. You're basically saying, I want a space on your platform and I agree to see targeted adverts. I agree to you using the analytics from my profile to direct me to other things that I see on my phone or on the internet. So we are then allowed to use this data, um, but then different universities and institutions and governments have policies around what data can be used and cannot be used. So this is above the policy of the platform. Um, and that is the one that we need to respond to. There are guidelines available for what data can be used. So the British Psychological Association has a guideline for social media research APA as a guideline and uh, Michelle, Kyle, Shelley and Jill and I have been working on the guidelines for um, the South African um, Research and the Psychology Association. So really interesting if you want to do your study online, lots to read, lots to learn. And um, we are still learning and these change every day. Social media is such a fluid thing and such a fluid platform that the rules are always changing. Next, I want to move to the online interviews and focus groups. And here, you always have to decide. The biggest decision is, am I gonna do this asynchronously or synchronously? A synchronous online focus group happens in real time and is conducted by your video or chat. And I say chat because you can do a focus group on WhatsApp. You can do a, fo a focus group via Skype. This chat that we have right now that's open on this window is part of the data that is being collected and it's happening synchronously. Um, if we had used the video function and all of our videos are on, we all see each other, of course, then it's also happening asynchronously. And it means that as in a room, when our people are sitting together in the focus group, it's just happening online. In the asynchronous groups, we have something that's called bulletin board focus groups or research communities. So you can set up a closed website. You can set up a um, WhatsApp group. You can set up a Hangouts group. You can set up a link that is protected or a private group on Facebook. And what you do there is you post a question and you give uh, participants maybe a week or two to answer that question so they can log in when they have time. So at the moment, I'm involved in a art space research um, project. So it's an international project with the art space research consortium. And now we are doing that study. We are, we are artists from all over the world and we are creating artworks during the pandemic. There is a single Instagram user account that has been created that we've all been given the passwords to. No one is allowed to invite other people to that account and we don't follow anyone else. Um, and we take photos of our artworks and we upload it to that account with text. So it's private, no one else can see it, but all the participants have the password. And the researchers are moderating the artworks that are uploaded and the text that we are sending. Later on, once they close the the data collection phase of the study, they will then set up the focus groups where we will talk about the artworks. But already, I'm seeing other artists' works and I'm commenting on what they are doing, just like they are commenting on the works that I am producing. Um, so it's also considered a asynchronous focus group study via Instagram. So just when, I, when you think about um, setting up your online interviews and focus groups, it's really important to follow these steps. Make sure that you set your goals properly. You know exactly what you want to achieve. You know how long you want to spend online. That has serious implications for um, 
the data that is required for your participants to join, the times that people are available. You have to be very specific about your time slots and about what it is that you want. As you know, with any um, interview, we can carry on forever talking, but on the online space, we don't have that luxury because not everyone has all the time to sit with a computer or has the data capacity to do that. Be sure about what your data plans are. So make sure that you have given participants what they need to participate without disenfranchising anyone in the study. You must recruit the right participants. What do I mean by right participants? They must fit the eligible, eligibility criteria of your study, but they also must be comfortable with your modus of data collection. You cannot interview somebody on video chat who is not comfortable with being interviewed on video chat. Your method must be something that is easy for the participants to take up and to be comfortable with. You have to make sure that all your participants have agreed to be recorded and to be online with others. Just because somebody has said that they give permission to be recorded individually doesn't mean they'll be comfortable showing their video in a focus group. So if you want in your focus group all videos to be on, not everyone is going to be okay with that. You have to be flexible and make sure that everyone's um, needs are met before the actual event happens. So that means phoning your participants beforehand, making sure everybody's given consent before the actual day, because on the day you're having a focus discussion. Select easy to use technology make sure that people are given all the training and the capacity they need before the day it can be very embarrassing for a participant to struggle with internet connection and then also to engage in conversation with people that they might not know so they might be struggling to log on and then after 20 minutes they've held up the focus group and now they expected to engage on the same level with others and if you think about power relationships and dynamics in focus group, that's something you really want to avoid. Ensure that you're able to meet the tech demands and that your participants are resource and trained. Be skilled in moderating online. So just as you have expectations of your participants, you need to have expectations of yourself. So you have to practice before you do this. It's not easy to conduct a focus group online unless you have done so a few times. Frame the right questions for online use and include activities. It can't just be you talking because that goes the, against the, the, the purpose of a focus group. You should be talking less than the participants. Also encourage, engage and elicit. So this is where the practice comes in. How do you encourage people to participate? What types of questions can you ask? What types of activities can you do? How do you get them involved and interested? and then capture data immediately and accurately. So the same like we did that word cloud, copy, paste it into the chat, show them this is what you're doing, this is how I'm working with the data. As soon as you have recorded it, transcribe what you have, make sure that you check, because with online interviews, people can enter and exit the study more quickly than in person. And as soon as that person leaves and you haven't had a check to to check the data, you might not know if you'll get hold of your participant again. Um, so I do think that this really presents an opportunity for us as researchers, students, social researchers, academics, to engage with um, internet research. What I've shown you is some of the methodologies that are available to you and alternatives to traditional methods of research that normally takes place face to face. And the internet has provided an opportunity, just like we use it for our literature reviews, to now use it for our data collections with persons. But we must critically engage with the methods. There's lots of methodological research that must be done around what works and what doesn't work, especially in our local context. Most of the research that we are looking at when it comes to the advantages and the disadvantages are based in Western societies. We need um, research that speaks to how we adapt these methods contextually to our South African context, to our African context. If you look at the number of internet users in SA, 
So we are a population of 58.8 million people. 62% of South Africans are active internet users. Now, if you think about sampling and population and sample size, 62% of 100% is a high number um, for you to get a representative sample of the population. And if you think about 62% being online, you also need to consider response rates for internet surveys. So depending on the topic of the internet research survey, people are going to engage. People are more likely to click on survey links about topics that interest them and that are controversial and that are exciting to know about. So anything related to sex, relationships, politics, or high traffic um, surveys. When we start checking around medications, then it's going to be people who take that medication are going to be more responsive. Generally, women are more responsive on internet surveys than men. So when you think around your, your sampling and your representation, be sure, especially for your quantitative research, that you are sampling and you're collecting demographic info so that you know when you can close the survey. Because sometimes you have to leave it open till all those um, criteria are met. So if you look at the second bar, 59% of South Africans access the internet on their phones. This means for your data collection, you need to think about whether people are using laptops or their cell phones. And the survey platform you're using must be adaptable to the mobile technology. If you are going to be doing focus groups on the phones, then make sure your participants have tripods. I don't know about you, but I can't hold my phone up for an hour and a half to talk to people and get a full face shot. And make sure that you have given guidelines to your participants around to how to put their phone um, so that it's sturdy throughout the conversation. Only 37% of South Africans are active social media users. So yes, they are accessing the internet. Yes, they are accessing it on their phones, but only 37% access social media sites. So when you are recruiting, know that you're only reaching a third of South Africans. How do South Africans access the internet? Like we saw, 59 to 60% via their phone. 16% via the personal or work laptop, 10% via the tablet, 9% through the personal desktop computer, so that's not a laptop, and then 2% via other device. These are things you must keep in mind when thinking around how you're going to collect your data. The most used social media platforms in South Africa at the moment, 89% of South Africans who use the internet, use WhatsApp, 87% use YouTube, 83% use Facebook. Right at the bottom is Viber, Twitch, WeChat, Tumblr. TikTok is only 16% and TikTok is also targeted at a younger audience. So adolescents, 20 year olds on TikTok. Um, and that is also where, something that you need to think about um, when you are recruiting online. If you're gonna target social media, target social media platforms, that have your target audience in mind. Um, the four main ethical considerations to keep in mind when you're thinking about this research is respect, the integrity of your work, social responsibility, and maximizing the benefits and minimizing the harm. I'm not gonna go into the detail of those, but those are four things you must consider. And in conclusion, I'd like to say the COVID crisis has compelled us to navigate the online environment in order to continue with our research endeavors. And the current situation has highlighted the need for better understanding of the methodological considerations around these methods. So the question is, are you ready to launch into the virtual space? And when does your countdown begin? Thank you, everyone. Um, so now I'd like to quickly hand over just for two minutes to Kyle. Um, Kyle, if you can just unmute your mic and maybe just in two minutes tell us about your study and then I'll quickly hand over to Risco because I am aware of the time. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Lynn, for all that information. It's been very, very helpful. 
Um, so I did um, my honors thesis under the supervision of Learn back in 2013, where we were exploring um, some online methods to collect data and we conducted um, an online qualitative survey. So basically what we did is we created a Google Forms um, survey, but we asked questions that um, where participants could type in their answers. So we didn't want to provide them with a preset um, criteria of what they needed to select. Um, and that allowed participants to provide the information that they wanted to. So on the topic that we, we explored, it was on the perceptions of masculinity and fatherhood. Um, so, for example, one of the questions was, um, what are five words that you would use to describe a man or a father, whatever the case might be? Um, and what was nice about that, that um, using Google Forms was it gives you a, a, a link which you can share on social media sites, via email, WhatsApp, any kind of um, social media site. Um, and then participants can simply click on the, the link and then um, have access to the survey. Um, and that they can do on a laptop, a cell phone, any kind of device that has internet access. Um, and then what's also nice about that is it collates all of the information from the, the, the participants into an Excel kind of spreadsheet, which you can download and then run different analyses and et cetera, um, which is very, very cool. Um, what else? Um, it's obviously, it's very, very easy to use, uh, very uh, user friendly. And another thing that was very important for us was if, for example, I mean, you know, we try to, to kind of gauge these things as closely as possible. But for example, if a participant indicated that they were not 18, um, to ensure that they didn't have access to the survey, it would automatically send them to the end of the survey without having them answer any specific questions. So that was just one of the nicer things about Google Forms that was important for us. Um, I'm not sure if I've missed anything or if there's anything. That no, I like think those, those are really useful. So Kyle used Google Forms. Um, and what he experimented with was doing the online questionnaire, but using open-ended questions. Um, and was actually a qualitative study. We were trying to gather information around people. People just had to give us five words about what a father means to them, what a mother means to them. And then he did content analysis on the data he received back. And the functionalities in Google Forms was really great, as he said, um, with moving people between sections of the survey. And I think, Carl, you were in your honors year when you did that, right? Yeah, so that was quite some time ago, yeah. back in the 20s. But I mean, it, the process was really intuitive and easy for you to get a hang of. Um, thank you so much, Kyle. I'd like to hand over to Risco uh, just for one or two minutes. To tell us about the work that she's doing. Very interesting work. Risco, do you mind unmuting your mic, please? Sure thing, Lynn. I'm also going to pop on my video so that I can just show you one of the devices that we use as well. Um, so also just for the purposes of understanding what I do is and how I got to be in this chat today is that Lynn invited me. Um, I'm currently working with Lynn on a PhD study and using visuals and the visual ethnography to, um, as part of a um, research outcomes. Um, and I do this with a lot of academics, especially at UWC. Actually, I do a lot of work in the Department of Religion and Theology and the Department of Anthropology. Um, I'm currently uh, putting together a show and a course for Facebook um, and the International Center for Journalism. And what we are doing is, um, in terms of an online basis, we're using Facebook as an online training platform uh, for education. So we, our region, our focus region is sub-Saharan Africa, and we targeted 10,000 sub-Saharan African um, journalists who will be trained over a six-week period, a very concentrated six-week period, um, on the essentials to become a mojo, which is a mobile journalist. Um, and we are using every possible functionality that Facebook has to offer in order to um, conduct this 
course. So one of the one of the tools that we use, which is great, which is something that I think um, a lot of people moving online in terms of education and academics can use is there's a facility in your Facebook Messenger called Rooms. And within Rooms, we've created something called a chatbot. So because we are only a small team of people, um, essentially there's only 10 of us that manage this whole, um, this whole process and had to come up with a curriculum for, um, the chatbot um, acts as the human in between. So when participants ask a question or they engage with the content, the bot itself responds as it would be one of us or one of the facilitators of the course. And it, it's so intelligent that it uses the correct language based on the data that Facebook extracts from the participants. So it will know, for instance, that um, Kenneth um, Odiambo is from Kisumu in Kenya and he's 27 years old and that he's a freelance journalist and he's had training in, let's say, videography before. So it will also respond to him um, in a language that um, would be suitable for him to understand. Um, the amazing thing with Facebook as well is that there are metrics, which, is, which we use a cross board for one of our other clients is also Snapchat. And you can draw metrics from all of these sites to be able to use um, and analyze the results of what your users are. Our general users for Snapchat and Facebook are between the ages of 13 and 24. So the content that we create is specifically for that age group. Um, and one of the research tools that we use are these glasses. Um, and they were actually created by Snapchat. And you'll see in the corner, there's a little light that flashes. Those are two cameras. So in order for us to gather visual information from our participants, we send them these glasses across the world um, and we are able to log into their Snapchat account and extract all the visual information that they record on there from their own perspective. So when they move around in an area and we're looking for something specific, for instance, if it was Lynn's HIV study um, and participants needed to engage with their natural environment or who they interact with daily, we would use the spectacles because it records audio as your phone does um, and also fairly strong visuals like your mobile phone would. And all we do is we extract all, all the information from there. We can also then transcribe all of um, the audio um, to extract what it is that we want out of it. Cool, then. Is there any other any questions? Um, thanks, Riska. So we have about five minutes for questions before the meeting closes. Um, I will continue the conversation on Twitter. So I will use the hashtag cyber research and I put that into the chat. Um, what we can do is if you are on Twitter, you can follow my account, which is research ambit and um, we can post questions and answer them and have a discussion on there if you are keen to follow the conversation there.